what's going on so change of scenery i'm upstate had my family's lock home with my daughter for the week so happy fourth of july to everybody hope everyone had a fun and safe one i was setting off fireworks a little bit ago so lords of salem and zodiac i'm sure you're happy to see this pop up notifications <laughs> uh sorry i couldn't get to it the last two days and yesterday i was traveling and everything but here we are now so I haven't seen this movie, I don't think, since it came out. It was 2012. And I remember being very excited for it because I love House of a Thousand Corpses to death and I adore Devil's Rejects. So at that point, he was two for two for me. So when I heard that he was doing Lords of Salem, I was super excited. And I didn't care for it, really. Like most people seem to not care for it. It's probably his most underrated and less talked about, like, least talked about film, in my opinion, out of all of his movies. Like, the aforementioned Firefly movies are always talked about. Three from Hell is talked about just because it's looped in there with those other two. 31, I feel, even is talked about more. Maybe, like, El Super Bisto is, like, the only one that's not talked about as much as Lord of Salem, but it's really not talked about enough. Because it is an ambitious movie. And there is some great camera work in here that I remember. There's some good music in here. There's some a good cast in here. I mean, we have Sherry Moon Zombie, like we have in all of his movies. She's not the, the best actress. <laughs> like, I like her as Baby Firefly. It just works. But she, I remember her not being bad in this. Like, she, she carries the movie just fine. It's just, we're always going to see her in his movies. He's just one of those directors that loves his wife so much, and that's great, and wants to show her off and put her in all his movies. And we've seen this many times in the past. So it's not surprising. It doesn't bother me that he puts her in. Would I like to see a better actress like play a leading role in a zombie film? I feel like maybe it could revitalize his career. So, <laughs> I mean, I'd like to see that, but he's never going to do it. In my opinion. I mean, of course, he could one day, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. We have Bruce Davison in here, who's great. We have Jeff Daniel Phillips, who's in so many of Zombies films. Sid Haig is here. I forget how big of a part he has. I don't remember. I don't think it's a big part. We have Meg Foster in here as, like, the lead witch, which she does pretty good in this that I remember. I remember they're creepy as shit the witches and we don't see much of them which is good another good thing because it's more effective when we do now i remember there being a good score in here too a uh, soundtrack which is another thing that zombie is great with just picking out the perfect songs like devil's reject soundtrack is so good with all the 70s uh, classic rock tunes. Great, great soundtracks. Same here. Like we have Velvet Underground. We have John Five solo uh, band. And another good band or two that I remember. So this is going to be an interesting, interesting rewatch. We have Ken Forey, the great Ken Forey. We have Dee Wallace, who's another one who zombie snatched up and uses in pretty much everything that he's done since this movie so let's talk lord of salem this is gonna be a definitely like i said an interesting rewatch so yeah like i said that i th think this was a very ambitious film for him after the two house of a thousand corpses movie uh, two house of a thousand corpses and you know what i'm talking about firefly films to go in this route and do this this is a very stylistic film. 
Like, that's one thing I remember and I can say. Like, there's, there's some great shots in this movie. There's some great lighting. There's some gr- great color usage. Like, all of that. The cinematography is great in this film. That's probably the biggest positive I can I remember from watching it for the first time. So, it's very, very different than House of a Thousand Corpses and Devil's Rejects. And then after this, he went on to remake Halloween. So, I feel like this, if anything, might be his most original film. Just his most, his own style, with him borrowing from as least influences as possible, if that makes sense. Like, as much as we love House of a Thousand Corpses and Devil's Rejects, you could see his influences worn on his, worn on its sleeve throughout that whole film. Just like all of Tarantino's work, Zombie's very, very similar with that. But with this film, it feels less influenced by a whole bunch of different work and old horror movies and everything like that, and it feels more, yeah, I guess original to me. So this might be, uh, I'm, I'm gonna wait until I <laughs> rewatch this here, but I think it might be his most original film. Next, so maybe next to House, House of a Thousand Corpses, even though that's very ch- chainsaw derivative, like we all know that, but I don't know, we'll see. So if anyone hasn't seen Lords of Salem, it is about this girl, Heidi Hawthorne, I think, right, who works at a radio station with Ken Forey, who is Herman, and another Herman played by Jeff Daniel Phillips. And they have on musicians and stuff like that, and they have on this, like, satanic band guy and he starts talking about his band and satan and serpents and all crazy shit like that and then she ends up getting this record with a note for her and it's just from the lords and it's this record of this eerie ass music that's one good thing too the sound design is great in this movie and the music that they use for you know the lords the witches music here it sounds great. It's very eerie. It's very, like, just experimental sounding. It's 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 creepy. Like, it's definitely effective. So that's a good, that's a positive for it right there. So then she ends up trying to figure out, you know, where did this record come from? Like, and people start listening to this music, and it starts putting them like in trances. And that's pretty much all I remember. I don't remember how this movie ends or anything like that. So that's a good way to like to start this rewatch because that's pretty much all I remember. So plot synopsis for people who haven't seen it, same plot synopsis for me. And of course we open up with the obligatory shot of Sherry Moon Zombie's bare ass. <laughs> like in every single zombie film. Yeah, so Heidi lives in this apartment uh, building and she lives in apartment two. And she goes out to pick up the newspaper and she sees and asks this figure in the doorway of number five, are you the new tenant? And then she doesn't answer and she just slams the door. So I remember this a little bit. Like, yeah, something to do with that room. It's very Shining. Like, if there's any influence this movie has, it's The Shining. Like, for sure. Definitely very Kubrick-esque, but not in, like, his style. Just... I don't know, it's hard to describe, but just the feeling of it, I guess, is very Shining-esque, which is great. Yeah, that's right, because then she comes downstairs, and she's talking to the landlord, and she says that there's nobody in that room. She says she wishes she can rent it out, but she can't. So, already, mysterious room mysteries going on. The score is not bad, either. Like, the original score, it's pretty good. Like, so far, everything is pretty good. Like, better than I remember so far. But we're only, like, 15 minutes in. So, they obviously are in Salem. (laughs) And the name of the radio station is, like, W-I-L-Z or something like that. uh, Salem Rocks. And, like I said, there's, like, a talk show. And they play music. And they have these interviews with bands and everything like that on it. We got some Rush on the soundtrack here. Yeah, great soundtrack. Great lighting when um, Herman, the Jeffrey Daniel Phillips Herman, 
That's going to get confusing. Uh, I think his last name is Salvador, so we'll go with Herman Salvador. As it's his name and makes sense to. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm exhausted at this point. Like, it's, yeah, a nine year old all day drains you. But uh, the lighting's great in here. And then she, they're at Heidi's apartment, and then they're listening to music, and then they end up putting on the album that they got from the Lords. And Ken Forey's character even nicknamed him and said, well, I'm assuming they're from around here, so let's call them the Lords of Salem. And we get this nice red lighting, very Argento, and they put the album on, and then Heidi goes into this like trance and sees like a vision. I'm guessing it's a vision of this coven of witches with Meg Foster playing the uh the leader and she's like licking this baby and they're like worshiping Satan and everything kills the baby I'm pretty sure they kill the baby yeah it look I mean you don't see anything but look it it looks like she fuck kills it <laughs> and knowing them I mean Satanists I mean I wouldn't put it past them would you but that whole vision scene and everything is great like very very good cinematography very good creepy acting for Meg Foster. Good stuff. Alright, so Meg Foster just bangs her head against the baby. I mean, it's still not good, right? <laughs> but I don't know if that means it's dead. Yeah, I mean, I like I said, I don't remember anything else really from this movie. So I don't know if they show it again. But she she's holding the baby after she licks it its head and stuff, like the blood off of it, and then she just takes it, and she smashes her face into it like four or five times. So I don't know if this baby is alive or dead, or if it even has anything to do with the rest of this movie. But I figured it's something to point out for some reason. Man, as great as the shots are of the hallway, like you're looking at me. This is door number five with the mystery person tenant that's not supposed to be there and then on the side here like over here is her room number two it looks great but man it is so shining that danny torrance in 1980s is shining should have been able to see this movie coming with his powers all the way back then <laughs> it is so shining it's 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 a little more than an homage so then we get a short little scene of this of an AA group. She's in AA, I'm guessing. So I'm guessing she's a recovering alcoholic or addict or something like that. I don't remember if that plays into the plot. But it's a cool little story. Like, just the one guy who's sharing. It's good, good dialogue. Like, it's a throwaway scene. But <laughs> for what it is, it's fine. So then they have on Francis, played by Bruce Davison, onto their radio show. And a great scene too with the dialogue but this is where sherry moon like sh she does fine for the most part but then baby breaks through a few times like there's a few times she'll deliver lines and it's such like yeah that, you're, that's baby like she's talking just like baby from the other movies so i mean it does take me out of it a little bit but he's like an expert uh francis on the salem witch trials and he starts saying they ask him uh you know, how many witches or supposed witches were killed back then. And he says 25. And I agree with her, with Salvador. I'm just going to call him Salvador, the other Herman, uh, Phillips. He says he's disappointed with the number. So was I. Like, if that's accurate, 25, that's it. That was all Salem Witch Trials. <laughs> I don't know, man. There should have been hundreds of, even if they weren't witches, fuck it, right? Now, this is a little stupid, but not really. It's just my nitpicking. But when she was at her apartment the night before with Salvador, and they, pl they played the record from The Lord of Salem, and she had that vision or whatever. Now, again, I don't know if that's an actual vision she has, because she doesn't mention it to him or to anybody yet. So I don't know if that's just for the audience or she actually, like, experienced that in some way. But whatever. But she ended up ending up with a headache. And she, like, she said, like, oh, like, I don't feel good, like, after that. So, I mean, of course. I mean, it could just be a random thing. You're not going to link it to a, a song that's playing, as creepy as it may be. But then the next day, 
or the next night here, like after they had the interview with Francis, who he's like touring his new book or something like that, like the truth about the Salem witch trials. And then she puts on the record and plays it on the radio station. And then we get a cool scene with like a bunch of people that are listening and they start just put in a trance and like they're just looking at where the sound's coming from off their radios and everything. One's taking a shower or about to take a shower and it's done very well. But why put that on there? Because then she even says, like, can you mute it in the studio? Because it's giving it's giving her a headache or it's making her f- not feel right. So this is twice now that she's put this song on and she don't feel right. I don't know. Like, it's a small little thing, but it's like, really broadcast this to everybody else and make them possibly have the same reaction? I like this little lingering shot we get when, uh, again, very Shining-esque, but... She goes into her, her apartment, it's number two, and then it's just shot down the whole way, looking at the number five door again. We get a lot of shots like this, if I remember. And the light, like there's a string of lights from the ceiling, and the last one, the closest one to number five, is swaying back and forth. It's a cool shot. Okay, so then she goes and sees these, like, mediums who see, like, things very deeply, they say. One is Dee Wallace, which she's like a self-help guru, she says. Good for her <laughs> in this film. And uh, then the other one, oh, what the hell's her name? It's killing me. She's, she was in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which I'm not really a fan of. Patricia Patricia Quinn or Quint something. Something with a Q. Someone let me know if uh, you're watching this premiere. But she, she's been in a few other things, too. They do a good job, too. Like, the acting is great in this movie. There's another woman here, I can't, the the landlord, I can't think of her name, but she's very familiar too. Pretty sure she was in another zombie film, like at least one. Great job too. So, I can't fault the acting really, except for (laughs) friggin' Sherry Moon Zombie, which again, she carries the film just fine. There's no terrible moments, but there are baby moments, and there are overacting moments. So, I mean, it's not the best leading role here, just like... With any film that she leads of his, or I'm sure any film that she leads ever, is going to be just like this. I don't know. Like I said, he should get a better actress, a much better actress, as the main role for a next movie of his. I think he could really benefit from that. I know he loves his wife, again, but at some point you got to kick her aside and be like, listen, I love you, but you know, I need someone with a little more range than you. I don't think that's so bad, right? Like, I'm not saying she sucks, but, you know, if I sucked at something, I, I'd want my significant other to tell me, you know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like time he brings her side, be like, listen, baby, I love you. You can have some little role or whatever you want, but the leading role is going to, you know, someone fantastic. And that's the last day Rob Zombie ever had sex. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't know if I'm right, so I shouldn't even say this, but... Doesn't it turn out that there the witches, like, come back to life or whatever from when they were killed, the Salem Witch Trials? That's what it is, right? I'm pretty sure because, I mean, it's pretty, pretty telegraphed and pretty predictable. I'd be shocked if that's not where it goes. I'm pretty sure I remember that the landlord, D. Wallace, and Patricia Quinn, I hope her name is, all are the witches, or they worship the wish- wishes. They worship the witches in some way. Something like that is what happens. Which, if that is the case, cool little um, decision to make the landlord's apartment be number one. Like her room number, her apartment number. It's number one. That's cool. Because it's like, if this is the witches trying to come back and everything like that, in their eyes, it's like, they're the most important thing. So they're in their first place. And then if they I, if they need Heidi for something, then she's number two. But let's see what, how it plays out. All right, this is the best thing I've seen so far in the film. Which, again, the, everything's been good so far. I'm like, this is better than I remember so far. We're about to enter the cent- second act. So props. I'm like, this is definitely, I can see it already, going to go up in my opinions, for this film on this watch. But we get a scene very short, very David Lynch, 
and it's just a Dutch angle, like from above, looking down the hallway, and the lights are burning very bright, and there's some white noise. That's what gives it the the lynch feeling the most is the white noise, background noise. Like the sound design is great in this film, like I said, especially it damn well should be. I mean, Rob Zombie's a musician. <laughs> He's a producer, all that. And the whole film centers around this record and and everything. So it better have goddamn good sound design. And it does. It's fantastic. But it's very Lynch-esque. Like, it's a top-down angle. Uh, then you just see the door is open in room number five. And then somebody walks slowly across, like, the door. like through, And you can see them. And then they disappear into the other side of the room. Really cool shot. Very lynch Great stuff. So then Heidi is going back into her apartment and she sees the door to number five, you know, swing open. And there's some red light emanating from it. And very, again, like deep Argento red color. Almost a deep red Argento. Whatever, you know what I mean. Argento deep red lighting and color usage. It looks great. It looks makes the door look red, like a red door. We got Insidious Red Door coming up. I got to do the sequels, actually. Like, I did Insidious very early. I think it was, like, maybe, like, a tenth or less video I did on the channel. I then just never did the sequels. I'm pretty sure they're all on HBO Max, and this has nothing to do with the movie at all. Okay, I remember this. There's, like, this big neon red cross that's hanging up in apartment five and she ends up being drawn to it and she's like reaching up at it and stuff like in a trance and there's other people in the room and that's a cool shot i'll give it that with doing like the red light on her as she with her hands as she's looking at it that's a good shot man i gotta say it's great seeing meg foster in a good role like in her older age, I think if I recall right, the last film that I saw her in on a rewatch or anything like that was, no, for the first time watch was for Jeepers Creepers 3 when I covered it for the channel. Oh, that movie was abysmal, man. <laughs> you want to hear a rant video, go watch both Jeepers Creepers 3 and Reborn, my videos for those. you, Those are rants. That and Return to Sleepaway Camp. It was like the only real, like, three big rants that I could think of. They were all pretty early on, too. But Jeepers Creepers 3 is absolutely dreadful. Like, so bad. Worse than Reborn for me. And that's just a crisis of a movie there, too. She's in 3, and she te she's terrible in it. Like, bad performance. So, seeing her here as the witch, she, she does a great job. Seeing her, like, naked and shit, all wrinkled up like an old witch, not so much. But Heidi leaves the room, and she's transfixed by whatever she was seeing, like, images of people being burned alive, you know, witches, apparently, like, supposedly. Excuse me. And another thing that adds very, the shining feel to this is, of course, you have the title cards that say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just like The Shining. So that adds to it. But I gotta say, man, I mean, I so far, like, halfway through this, on this second watch, I don't think I saw this a second time, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. I think I saw it once, when it came out, pretty sure it might have been in theaters, and then never again. So this has been interesting, for sure. But I might just start this argument that this I think this might be his most imaginative film. And like I was saying earlier, I think this might be his most original film. Even though, yeah, the Shining references are through the roof and the, the, the Shining feel to it, it's very, very heavily inspired by the Shining. But what it does is different. Like, it, it has its own thing, it has its own feel, it has its own story. Like, it's not like it's a haunted hotel and stuff, and you get the similar shot and framework and stuff like that or anything like that like it does its own thing so i don't mind it being very shining-esque i mean house by the cemetery by lucio fulci is very shining inspired but it, it, it does what it does amazingly so it doesn't matter that it's influenced that much by it you don't have as much as of a hodgepodge like stew of influences 
in this film that you can say, oh, this is so this, this is so that, like his other films, like House of a Thousand Corpses, you say Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and with Devil's Rejects, you could say, you know, all the spaghetti westerns, and, and, and you know what I'm saying? This film feels very original, and I think it might be his, his most imaginative film, like, for sure. Most Him at his most creative. I really wish Heidi was played by someone better. <laughs> Like, that's, like, my main complaint here. Like, I, I really wish he got somebody else besides his wife to play her. Besides that, this is going up a decent amount here. And then we get a little um, reference to The Exorcist when she's seeing, and this time, like I said earlier, when she saw, when she listened for, for the rest, blah, blah, when she listened to the record for the first time, and she went into, like, that trance, and I wasn't sure if she saw that vision or not, this she definitely sees now. Like, she sees Meg Foster, the witch, like the head witch. I'm not sure if she has a name. I'm, I'm sure she has a name, but <laughs> I don't know what it is. She's standing there, and she ends up saying, you're cunting daughters of Salem. Obviously, huge homage to uh, The Exorcist, which is great. Do you know what she did? Your cunting daughter? I don't know why you like in that movie, why she switches to British. For no fucking reason for that line, but it's iconic. So Heidi's starting to get real stressed out. She's starting to see things more and more. She sees, like, this weird scene that plays out that, honestly, I don't even remember what it was. But then she ends up seeing this dude, like, with this weird mask walking a goat, which is very, you know, symbolic of Satanism and, and Satan and stuff, the goat used for sacrifices. And he says, like, we've been waiting for you. And then he just vanishes. So she's starting to freak out. <laughs> and then we have Francis, the uh, guy who wrote the book on the Salem Witch Trials, who was on the show, who's trying to figure out where he heard the term the Lord, the Lords of Salem, which I have a small issue with that. He also noticed the music, though. So, like, that makes sense. But Ken Forey named them the Lords of Salem. I mean, they were just called the Lords. But, I mean, I guess he could have just assumed very well, like he did, and said, well, they must be from Salem, so let's call them the Lords of Salem. And they already were known as the Lords of Salem before that? That's the only thing I can think of, because if not, like, Ken Forey made that up on the spot. He was like, let's just call them, you know, the Lords of Salem. And then this guy's like, why, that sounds so familiar, the Lords of Salem. So, he, it had to have been their name, <laughs> and they had to have been to referred to it before. Ken Forey just, like, made it up again for the second time, right? So, Margaret Morgan is the name of uh, Meg Foster, the head witch. They chose it on Amazon Prime, you know, it shows the cast and shit. <laughs> I had to look. I was like, it's, it, it's really annoying me if they said her name already. Again, I don't know if her name is important at all or ties into anything. I kind of am now remembering that doesn't Heidi, her last name's Hawthorne, doesn't that tie into... Like, she's a descendant of a witch or something like that? Maybe. I, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, when, uh, so his musician wife, uh, Frances, they start dissecting the music because she recorded the show because she listens to his all his interviews and stuff on radios so she recorded it and they're playing the music back and she's on the piano playing and stuff that's a cool scene when they're dissecting the music and she says you know it could have just been and she is in somehow related to somebody from back in the day i don't know if it's a witch but like her father has a diary that francis has the last five pages of and it's his name is hawthorne that's her father so, or, or not father, but you know what I mean, uh, descendant. Totally different uh, word and meaning than father, but <laughs> that's what I meant, descendant. Speaking of House by the Cemetery by Fulci uh, a little bit ago, th three bats in our house here upstate. It's in the middle of nowhere, it makes sense. I mean, it doesn't really happen often, but there was a bat flying around the living room last night. I freaked the fuck out. <laughs> We, get, we got rid of him. We found him. And we found another one that was like half alive, half dead. 
Then we found a third one, got rid of that, and now I hear one chirping, like, in this room, in my room here. So if I'm, if <laughs> this video makes it and I'm not at the premiere, I probably fell asleep. But if you don't see me tomorrow, Dracula got me. Or I just slipped, fell, and hit my head running away from a fucking bat. Alright, I'm alive still. <laughs> So far, it has. I have seen it. But I'm telling you, yo, it's right up there. It's right up there, in the wood. Like it is, and I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I might cut this video short. No, I'm kidding. But we have uh, Peter Fancy in here. That's his name, right? I didn't even look, but Richard Fancy. All right, I knew it was, he was a fancy guy. Richard Fancy's in this, and. This is Richard uh, Lynch's last film. I'm pretty sure this was his last movie before he passed away. But Francis goes to see him, this uh, other specialist on like, the Salem Witch Trials. And it does come into play, uh, Meg Foster's characters. Uh, Margaret Morgan, pretty sure that's it. There's like a whole curse, supposedly, that... She, as a witch, before she was killed, put a curse on the Hawthorne bloodline, and that the child of the devil will be born through one of the daughters from that bloodline. So, Heidi, perfect candidate. Yeah, Herman Salvador, uh, even, he asks Heidi, uh, well, he doesn't come out and ask her, but she knows that what he's hinting at, and she says, like, come on, dude, I'm clean if that's what you're trying to get at. So, yeah, she's a recovering addict. So she starts telling him that, like, ever since I heard that record, every time I hear it, I just feel sick, and she's about to say, but then she starts coughing up blood. And I, I, it's killing me, the movie that they're watching on the TV. Well, I mean, you know, you know how big of a buff, like, Tarantino-level zombie is. He always puts in some old-school films. In his movies. I can't think of what this one is during the scene. But the way that it's shot is awesome. Like she's coughing up the blood. And then she has like this vision of like these weird things. Like with the no face. Like it's so hard to describe if you haven't seen the movie. But <laughs> they have like no face. But I don't. it's not that they're masks. They don't look like masks. It just looks like they're faces. Like it's so hard to describe. But like she's struggling against them. Like it's a great sequence. Uh, then they start ripping her insides out. The gore looks good. Doesn't look fantastic or anything like that, but for for this type of movie, it's fine. But as soon as you start having hallucinations or visions or dreams like this that are so intense and vivid, and you're getting your friggin' intestines ripped out of you in gory-ass detail, and your nightmares, I mean, it's time to see a doctor, right? Like, this is when we go to a psychiatrist. This is what they're for, right? It's times like this. So, Heidi has had it. I'm surprised I said that the first time. <laughs> I, I'm kind of disappointed now because, like, there's not really anything I could turn into bloopers. So, oh well. But she ends up going and scoring drugs. And it, I'm not sure. It looks like she's either smoking heroin or she's... I mean, if she was smoking, she's using a crack pipe to inhale, but, I mean, it's weird, but she's getting high, and so she's slipped off the wagon, but who could blame her? I mean, these fucking witchers are screwing with her, man. All right, as much as I said earlier that I, I like the, you know, the landlord and the other two women, who are supposedly psychics, that are probably the uh, witches, or worship them, or them come back, whatever. As much as I like them as characters... I really don't like the Rosemary's Baby feeling that I get here. <laughs> like those, some of you know, I don't, I'm, I do not like Rosemary's Baby. It's just not for me. It's a classic. I'm not going to say it's, it's a bad film. It's not. It's just not for me. And the whole thing with the apartment building and having, you know, the tenants and the landlord stuff in on it and everything, it's very Rosemary's Baby. It's very Polanski. It's, it's, it's very, off-putting to me. I, d I don't care for it. So yeah, they're they're all involved. And <laughs> they're walking down, they kidnap drug her, and Francis tries calling, and 
one of them picks up and like, no, you got the wrong number. And then they throw it back in his face so like, fright, frighteningly rude for you to be calling at this hour. <laughs> Just click. So and then they put her in her wheelchair and they start wheeling her towards apartment number five. Okay. But when she goes, when she's wheeled in, she's... <laughs> There's your blooper, all right? When she's wheeled into the room, uh, into apartment five, what an amazing shot and sequence with the the way that he shoots this room. And it's this, like, big cathedral with, like, red walls and has a little bit of the, like, repeating wallpaper. Looks very Suspiria, like, from the intro hanging scene, the pink and white. And then just the lighting, man, it's yellow. The color usage is great. It's it's very Argento. It's very Bava, too. Like, it, it's gorgeous. Like, the cinematography is fantastic in this film. And she has, like, the makeup on, white makeup with black, like, around the eyes and stuff. And she's wearing a striped white and black shirt. It looks all right. I mean, it doesn't look great. It's nothing like, oh, wow, that looks really cool. Kind of looks kind of generic. But it is what it is. It doesn't look bad. Right before it turns to Saturday, again, very Lynch here. She's sleeping. She comes out of that room, and they were waiting for her the whole time. Like, that was her own little journey into that room. So I, I'm guessing that's, like, her projection, of, like, her mind's projection of what she thinks is in the room. Because, I mean, it makes no sense with the layout of the building and stuff. The room's not really like that. So this is her mind projecting it, I'm guessing, or the, the witch is projecting it onto her mind. So she ends up coming back out, and then she goes to bed. And very Clockwork Orange, this movie is so Kubrick, it's not even funny how Kubrick this movie is. Like, a little overboard at times. But very Clockwork Orange type shots, too. Like, just the white hues, the color white, like, very reminiscent of the, the milk bar. Great to see! Like, it doesn't, like, none of this is bad in any way. I'm just, like, trying to dissect this movie a little bit, like, in its influences. But definitely a lot of Lynch here. Definitely, not a lot, but a little bit. Definitely a lot of Kubrick, like, too much. And Rosemary's Baby, which is not a good thing for me. So we got, like, two-thirds that's working for me right now. But she is sleeping, and then a midget, or dwarf, whatever it is, a little person fun sized ends up coming and you just see the silhouette and he just walks in and stands in front of the bed and she doesn't wake up or anything and then he disappears so who this midget is this fun sized dude I have no idea hence why it feels like Lynch so also anything from this point on well from the scene that she relapses you can pretty much look at this in two ways you can look at it that this is really happening or you can look at it as you know, this is all visions and delusions and drug-induced stupors from her relapsing back into drugs and that none of this is really happening and that it's just feeding into the whole, you know, the actual record and song existing is feeding the delusion that she's having and it, she's spiraling deeper and deeper into it, which is interesting. I'm sure there's some things that contradict it, like near the end or something, but it's cool that you can look at it that way throughout the movie. The exterior shots of the apartment building and the lighting used and stuff, beautiful. Looks, looks great. So Francis goes over and says that he wants to see Heidi. He talks with the landlord. And she brings him into her apartment. And with the two other women, with Dee Wallace and Patricia Quinn. It is Patricia, Patricia Quinn. I looked it up. But the two of them, the three of them are talking to him and being a little flirty even because he's an older guy. And then they end up just knocking him out and then they end up killing him. And the dialogue is pretty creepy, man. And just like the way that, um, oh, it's kill I can look it up, but Judy Geeson, Geeson, Ge I'm going to say Geeson who, uh, who plays the landlord. She's fantastic in this too. And her line is of saying, like, did you come here to fuck her mind? Like, Heidi, did you come here to, to put your cock in her brain and fuck her mind? <laughs> like, like real, like, fucked up stuff, like, coming from an older woman like that. All right, the shot of with the deep Argento red lighting of the nun outfit being worn by the no face, whatever those things are. That's a great shot. And that's creepy as hell. 
All right, the whole scene when she goes into the apartment and it turns into like a theater and the landlord and the other two are on the stage and then the witches show up behind them and then they start playing the song on stage and then people there's a whole crowd that out of nowhere just appears and stands up and they're in a trance and everything all of that is fantastic like that might be this might be my favorite scene in the film so after that fantastic scene we get the ending here where they pretty much take her the witches and she gives birth to either you know the antichrist or the rebirth of satan it's cool looking like very lovecraft with all the tentacles and shit like that like it's not a baby because <laughs> that's first i was starting to think maybe i was like maybe this is it makes sense that earlier in the film the first vision she has that i said i'm not sure is a vision with the, with her licking the baby uh, margaret maybe that's her seeing like her future giving birth to the antichrist and the baby's the antichrist but no it's not it's, it's this tentacle fucking thing <laughs> But it looks great. So, let me say this. This film went up a lot for me. I think this has the best cinematography in a zombie film. I think it has the best sound design in a zombie film. I think it's his most imaginative and creative film, like I said. There's some great stuff here. There is. It's a little long hour and 40 minutes i mean you could trim 20 minutes easily off of this and it would be fine but the lighting is and color usage is fantastic in this like the, the, i can't say enough about the cinematography like it's a beautiful film this is a very good movie like on this rewatch this, this i'm very surprised so zodiac thank you for the uh, request man and make me uh rewatch this and revisit this because this uh definitely went up for me a decent amount this has a 5.2 on imdb it sounds about right but i'd, I'd put this at maybe a six and a half maybe i don't score things really but that's uh probably around where i put the six and a half maybe even a seven like this is pretty damn good this is basically you could have called this like the shining or Stanley Kubrick's Rosemary's Baby. That's basically how this movie is. It's a mix between The the Shining and Rosemary's Baby. I, I do not like <laughs> Rosemary's Baby, like I said. So that part doesn't work for me. That's what brings this film down for me. It's very reminiscent of that. The pacing is also kind of reminiscent of that. It's uh, To me, it's a lot more interesting, though, what's going on. So at least it gets that edge over uh, Rosemary's Baby. But The Shining is fantastic, as we all know. So, great rewatch, great film, and uh, definitely very underrated for a zombie, for sure. So, this uh, definitely went up some decent points for me. So, all right, guys, I'll have something else out tomorrow. I'm not sure what. Maybe I'll put a poll up. Take care. I hope everybody had a healthy, happy, safe, non-explode-yourself-to-pieces uh, <laughs> 4th of July, if you celebrate here in the States, and not my Brit friends over there, because we don't give a shit about them on this day. America! America!